for some questions. What I do have is a video of that uh, powerhouse that uh, is in a time lapse. I might put that on while we're doing some question and answers because it runs about 10, 15 minutes, but you can watch it in the background. So thank you very much. So is there any questions? Get, I, I know you said used barge for Clohomes, but uh, for some of the other remote mountainous locations, how do you get all of the materials in? It's all by truck. Sorry? It's all by truck. So do you have yeah. to build roads for that, or do yeah. you use existing roads? We, most of the, there's a lot of uh, forestry roads out there, but um, we usually improve the roads or we do small road extensions. But from an economic standpoint, for us to build a, a, a new road for the building of one of these projects is usually cost prohibitive for, the, for that purpose. And so what we're trying to do is build on the existing infrastructure. And, and that's why they're, they're called resource roads and forestry resource roads. They're not intended just for forestry uh, logging activities. They're meant for mining, hydro development, you name it. And, and, and we're, we've actually changed, through some of our projects here, we've changed the Ministry of Forest outlook towards those kinds of things as to more of a forest management approach as opposed to a logging management approach. And designing roads that are more suitable for multi-purposes. So is it up to the province then to decide where might be a good place to start developing these roads and then you kind of go from there? Um, not really. Um, it's mostly the forestry industry that has proliferated those and there is just an amazing network of roads out there today and, and to areas that maybe they shouldn't have been built in all honesty. Um, and those, those roads are actually a real problem now because a lot of them are failing and causing sediment loads into rivers and causing all sorts of other problems. And by us going into some of these areas, we're actually restabilizing the area and getting, making them more sustainable over <coughs> time, uh, you know, where our opportunities exist. So it, it's a, uh, a beneficial uh, spin-off of large activities. Yes? Um, what energy credits do you need to be profitable with a very low head turbine? And uh, uh, how long do they last? Like, what's the expected lifetime? OK. Uh, they're uh, designed, I'll do the first one, uh, the yeah. second one first. The design life of that turbine is 50 years, and um, and there are maintenance activities that go on with the uh, with the turbine, but um, the first maintenance uh, time is uh, three years, and so you after installation, the first time you touch it is three years out, and then uh, the next one is 10 years, so it's fairly low maintenance from that standpoint. In comparison to wind, where you're up inside those wind turbines, somewhere between every week to two weeks you're up and doing maintenance work on those turbines. So they're under very high stress load and other, other challenges with that, those designs. Hydro is a much less maintenance intensive uh, industry, um, and, but it has its set of challenges too. Uh, it's a very high capital intensive. Uh, and that's why we need contracts that are long term. Um, uh, I'll give you a couple case studies on that. Uh, first I'll talk to your price. Uh, Today, in Alberta, our price is hovering around 80 bucks a megawatt hour. Um, not too long ago, 20 years ago, it was in around 25, 20, uh, 25 to $30 a megawatt hour. Um, and that that's creates, creates an interesting dynamic. In British Columbia, we're at about $102 a megawatt hour for generated electricity. And in Ontario, under the FIT program for hydro, we're $131 a megawatt hour. So it varies substantively across the region. I, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to read the newspapers recently, a uh, week and a half ago or so, there was a front page on the Saturday spread about electricity prices across Canada, and Alberta had the highest one. So we've had, we've had our challenges too, and because we're a fuel-based generation, uh, electric generation market, uh, we're now suffering from some of the fluctuations of generation supply and non-long term commitment. And uh, I'll give you an example of that. I built the, hydro, uh, the Belly River Hydro Project in, uh, in southern Alberta, a little three megawatt job on the, on the, uh, on the irrigation canal. Ralph Klein was an energy minister back then. He cut the ribbon for it back in uh, 1990. It had signed a 20 year research and development program contract to as the Alberta government wanted to see whether or not renewable energies were viable in, in Canada. 
in Alberta, I should say. And uh, so we, we got a whopping 52 bucks a megawatt hour when the market was at 26 bucks. Everyone thought this was ludicrous. Why would you subsidize a hydro development to that degree? For, and given that it was so small, no one made a real big fuss about it, and they let us go ahead with a few developments. We did about 200 megawatts, I think, at the time, uh, various types of wind and hydro. And um, well, that today that plant uh, just was going off contract uh, last year. We renegotiated an extension. Well, the current market price for electricity is $80. $80. That plant is only 20 years out of its 100-year life. So it's got 80 years life left. And we could have contracted that at 52 bucks and made just a windfall of money um, for the next 80 years. The difference is, is that uh, we could actually operate that plant for around $20 a megawatt hour because the capital is now paid for. It's now just operation and maintenance costs from, and refurbishment of some of the equipment over time. So now we have $20 a megawatt hour, uh, uh, value power available to us from a society standpoint for the next 80 years. In a market right now that's at $80 a megawatt hour, roughly, on average, spiking up to $150 to $1,000 a megawatt hour in some spot market prices in Alberta today. So from a long-term sustainability perspective, this is what I'm talking about with no fuel cost and what the long-term effect of that. But you have to make the commitment. You have to make the commitments in the order of 20 to 40 years. Contracts from Ontario are 40 years for height. In BC, same thing. 30 to 40 years. So that's that's the difference in mindset, if you will, between renewable energy versus the current spot market, deregulated market that we have here in Alberta. Long with the answer. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. So what do you think how much actually we can get from the hydro for color of the place low? Like in prospective. Yeah, regardless of all our regulation uh, obstacles. And well, in Alberta, um, the government just commissioned a study that was finished last year. And they identified uh, upwards of 15,000 megawatts of hydro energy commercially available in Alberta. To give you a, a perspective on that, that's about one and a half times our current energy usage in Alberta. So it's not that there isn't a resource. Okay, it's whether or not is it commercially viable, and are we willing to pay some of the uh, social and environmental concerns, uh, concerns and, and how do we weigh those versus oil sands versus uh, gas? With gas prices at an all-time low or, or nearing a very low point, um, you have to really wonder about that. Okay, uh, and the design of our transmission system is another problem in that. Our transmission system in Alberta here has been designed for centrally generated energy going to various populated centers. When you go to something like a hydro generation scheme, you need a very broadly distributed uh, interconnected system. And we have not got a transmission system that is designed for distributed generation in Alberta. It's not to say that we couldn't achieve that with relatively little pain. We can. There is a lot of opportunities for doing that. But the system planners don't necessarily consider that because there isn't a, a real policy around that. Whereas in Ontario, although they're uh, a lot further behind in their transmission upgrading work because their their system is very antiquated and needing upgrading a lot, um, the same time is, is they are now undertaking planning that includes distributed generation, and both in solar and hydro and wind, and are are actually putting that into their planning mix to a much higher degree than what we're doing. Have you guys looked at any uh, electricity storage uh, options using hydro for supplement things like wind? Well, um, our best hydro, uh, storage is called snow, and uh, or reservoirs, and it's by far the most efficient. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, efficiencies in hydro um, on the turbines. We're in around 92 percent efficient on, on on the energy available from the water. Uh, by the time it goes through the plant and electrical system and, the, and everything else, we're still well above 80 percent, and uh, and those are the kinds of efficiencies that this in, this technology brings.